a production of South Carolina ETV. Funding for this program was provided by the KBK Foundation, Roland Grimm, and the South Carolina Arts Commission, which receives support from the National Endowment for the Arts. is contemporary to the extent that it's happening now and derived from all the things that have happened recently that are behind it. But at the same time, I'd like to think of it as more timeless and not relying on fitting into a certain era or genre, but standing on its own at any place, any time, anywhere. I like drawing because in the studio, it's a process, it's not really the product. It's always kind of surprising to see finished drawings in a museum context or something like that. Because the real pleasure in drawing is when it's just happening and it isn't really that thought out. You can work with the movement, the kinesthetic, I think, of drawing in a way that's very similar to the eye movement of a sculpture when it appears. I can make four loops, for example, one of my favorite themes, and do it in such a way that allows everything to line up, kind of tunes things up. And as you can see, this point right here, this motion, is a, a freeze in time. This is a loop, comes around, speeds up the big loop, works back into the point. So I can soup around, around, and back, almost as if I'm a conductor. And you can do the same thing, of course, when it becomes a sculpture. If you imagine this now, concave surface here, positive surface here, kind of coming around the outside, working with the middle section passing in front of the back, who knows, maybe there would even be a combination, an edge that would become a link between the back and the front, really build up the vertical in such a way that it could stand somehow, maybe work in gravity if we have to deal with such a terrible thing. But the idea being that drawings like this are really what lead to the next step, the drawings that become sculptures. Here's the case where two parallel themes, the purple lines, spirals in one direction, and the red lines, competing spirals in opposite directions, overlapped, became one continuous theme, and this, in fact, led to a five-foot sculpture, which was developed in styrofoam and hopefully will be turned into a bronze. Styrofoam is, is great stuff. It's, it's easy to work, it's light, inexpensive, and, and it's white, which means it shows up all your imperfections. I can start a drawing in the styrofoam, do the sides, the back, the front, develop the three-dimensionality of this theme or this design, and then carve it away. Develop the forms, perforate them, rasp. Take off the corners and finely tune the whole thing. And there's no grain to worry about. It's not heavy like marble. And it doesn't chip and crack. And it doesn't have to be cast like bronze. So it's an extraordinary material for just the sketchiness and the building up of the ideas and experimenting. I can glue pieces back on. I can lop them off again or just start over again, and in another couple hours, I'm back to the first place. I'm influenced by relationships, I think, and patterns in things I see and things I hear. It's kind of a quirk. I, I don't really know why, when I listen to music, I see sculpture. But it, uh, 
it happens that way, and I guess I'm hoping that when people look at the sculpture, they'll feel some music. My grandfather was a carpenter, so I always had access to wood and woodworking tools. And so whittling and carving led to building and constructing, which led to a combination of the two where I would create things by adding and then taking away. And I guess that's uh, the beginnings of the three-dimensional sense. When you're in high school, your guidance counselor doesn't really tell you to become a sculptor. And in fact, I was encouraged to, uh, to study mechanical engineering, uh, got my degree in architecture. And uh, I owe a lot to that, I think, in terms of the reasonableness. And yet I wanted to break away from all those things, the symmetry and the organization and the mechanisms, and do the things that were more in tune with feelings and expressions and emotions. So uh, the architecture led to studies of interiors, which led to insides becoming outsides. My wife Patricia is a ballet dancer and a choreographer. So she's both a sculptor and the sculpture itself. She can do things with her body in the fourth dimension. Time and movement and motion. Which embody exactly what she's thinking in her mind's eye. I envy her that opportunity. I wish I could be the sculptor myself, and the closest I can come is to put myself into the forms and follow through and around the surfaces. In my case, uh, I've always been bothered by gravity. You know, why do trees always have to be sitting there with the roots and the heavy stuff on the bottom and get lighter and lighter? If, if you were an organism that grew underwater, where you could just be buoyant and float around, you could grow in any direction you wanted, and you'd be free to to let the aesthetic have a little more control instead of always be held back by, in this case, the law of gravity. One of the ways to approach that is to fly. And uh, like many kids, I always dreamed of being able to fly. And here I am, living in an era where that's possible. Flying, the way I do it in, in ultralight aircraft, or maybe the way anybody would do it if they were a skydiver or even a skin diver flying through the ocean in the water. Uh, flying is a way to become the sculpture, I think. You know, I'm, I'm free to not only go in all these different dimensions and directions and speeds, but I can be going in the air in one direction and changing position in another. You know, an airplane can go up and at the very top of the loop when it's run out of gas, just kind of spin around and drop back. So you can not only change speed and location and position, but you can actually change orientation in the middle of that curve. So you get to be the sculpture. You, you are inside the creative force, and you are making the loops and the curves and the spirals. I usually work with spirals, too, because I think it's a life force form. It's the, the form of the galaxy. It's the way growth is portrayed in plants and animals. My favorite part of flying is, is coming in for the landing. When you line everything up and the runway is in this direction, the wind's in that direction, you're in a third direction and orientation, and you, you fit it all together. And you go from at one time being part of the ether through that transitional stage, and gradually you blend right into the earth. It's the same thing when you're walking along the ocean, you know, and you're right along that, that threshold, that, the surf line, where everything on one side is, is liquid and fluid. And everything on the other side, where your feet are settled, is sand and ground and terra firma. And you're right at that edge. If you could fly through the air and leave a trail in exactly the position with all the molecules you displaced, or, or if you were a, a ballet dancer and you leap through the air, and then you could pour bronze into the space the dancer took up. That that would be a remarkable sculpture. And I think that's maybe one of the things I'm trying to do here, you know? Where I know that there's a transitional change going on here. Wide to thin, curved 
to flat, surface to edge, two lines to one, movement to a point frozen in time. All those things are there, and I can be inside the sculpture. I can be there and control all those impulses and pass them on to, to somebody else. Maybe that's the, the composer side of all this, but to me, this is flying. This is just captured, solidified, moving through space. To the extent we understand time, I guess we're all part of the fourth dimension, but I rely on interaction with the viewer to add that. I can't see all my pieces all the time, but they're there living with the work, and of course they can. It's important to lure people in, and to create that human element to, to cause the chemistry to, to happen. So people start following the work with their eyes, and then they you can't resist touching it. And before they know it, they're involved in the work. Maybe their arm is even caught, and it starts to turn. And then it takes on the fourth dimension. It's starting to move, and so are they. This is titled Blumen, B-L-U-M-I-N with a apostrophe. Mm -hmm. And it's not a musical title uh, specifically. It's a title of a poem and lyrics which were written by a young woman who uh, was killed at the age of 18. She was quite creative and artistic and you know, a songwriter and a dancer and a musician. And, and her family had asked if I could do a, a portrait of her, I mean an abstraction, as an elegy. Huh. She was at that wonderful stage in, in growing up when you're, you're reaching out, you, know, you want to absorb everything there is. She's old enough now mm -hmm. to, to try everything, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she was internalizing things because she was a poet and a writer and mm -hmm. you know, she was pulling it all back in as, as hard as she could. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that's yeah, in here somewhere. That, yeah. The viewers of my work are the people who really understand it. They've given it the time and the energy and they live with it. They come to the studio, they follow my work. So. I owe most of what I am to them, in the sense they're the ones who've gone out on a limb and acquired the work of an emerging artist without having to feel that they should wait for the critics and read about it in 7.3 art books. So I'm a full-time artist because of all those people who felt something powerful and special about the work and have put their money where their feelings are. For most of the people that see the piece of art that I have of David's, most of the time it elicits this inquisitiveness about art. It elicits a response of, I want to learn more about how bronzes are done and how did this person do this and, and what does this mean and it's wonderful that it turns and it elicits those kinds of responses. Very few of my friends have said, well, I think that's a seashell. It's the kind of work that doesn't force you to think it's something. I try to put so many things into each work that it not only amuses me, but delights me when other people can see the same things. So if a viewer says, oh, I can see a, a whale jumping in and out of the water, surfacing, splashing, I think that's terrific. Chances are there's some of that in there. It may not be direct or in intended specifically, but in general, uh, all those things are influences to me. And if I can be the trigger, then I think that's honest and, and how it's meant to be. The inside looks like it's a, it's a bell kind of type deal. And then it, and it, maybe the reason it had it turn is so that you can have it face in different ways to have the sound come out. I'm glad that this kind of work, this sculpture, can be experienced by the blind. It's one of the few things that visually impaired people can uh, really understand. And in fact, they can probably understand it in many ways better than I can. That some of the sculptures are in a museum with a gallery for the blind uh, feels to me greatly because there are lots of times when I'm making these pieces that I rely on what I cannot see. I use a mirror to flip things around for objectivity, distance, and angles. And I also close my eyes and have to rely on my sense of touch. And that's the feeling part of feeling that makes sculpture so special to me. And uh, there's something appropriate 
about having the title of a sculpture in Braille. And it feels like a planet. Like a spaceship? I choose to work in mahogany compared to pine or teak or walnut because it's a big tree, it's, it's a large block, so I can really work the grain and control it. The grain is uniform and wants to be a certain way, and I can use that to my advantage. Also, the, the coloring is warm, it's lifelike and it's an intermediate tone and it's close to the cherry I grew up with as a kid so I feel quite comfortable working with mahogany and it also develops a unique luster when you're just finishing it up I'll see if I can demonstrate it here it has a depth where the light goes into the pores and refracts back and has kind of a lustrous glow unique I think to this wood all my works have musical titles. That's a way I can pay homage to, to that which inspires the works. And it's a lot of fun coming up with just the right title, which gives a hint of what's going on in the sculpture, but not much more than that. All I want to do is elicit a feeling from a viewer that lets them know that I know, that they know, that I know. And so the titles usually come from a long list I've saved, often from the Harvard Dictionary of Music, that give certain feelings and just subtle hints of what's really going on. Texture, like smoothness or, or, or edges, is one of the tools for form and space. I use it as a way to bring up certain surfaces and to contrast one side with another in the jazz series, for example, where you can retain the, the rough carving of the chisel marks and related directly to the smoothness of an interior flowing form. If you were to look at Duke Ellington, here is Duke sitting over here. Here is the drama up here. Here's the sort of read section. And, and this is what you got when you started at the beginning. Finally, at the end, it just sort of oozes out of this way. And you, dee da ra dum bum dee da coming right on out. So you sort of start here and you get theme and variations around here and then coming through here and that's, that's sort of the end of the piece. This is definitely a very fast piece. This is, this is a fast piece, but it's classical. Don't you see that in this? It's, it's, much, it's much more formal. While this is, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Look at this side right here. Forest. Sometimes I feel the nose like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home a long ways from home sort of that kind of quiet gospel feeling that goes along with it but i don't think you have any difficulty seeing a certain rhythm a certain melody in all of this which tends to arch up oh, now of course this is purely subjective on my part because as a singer as a musician and as a musician who, who specializes in African-American music. That's what I'm looking for in particular in these pieces. It's important for me as an abstract artist to incorporate the imaginations of others in the viewing of the work. It's a translation in the sense I'm not communicating specific forms, but there's a strong communication in the sense of linking thought patterns or 
connecting with other people's experiences or emotions. I'm passionate about my work and passionate, therefore, that other people see it and understand it and that I have a chance to, to show it. The gallery setting is a terrific form and so are museum exhibitions. I think when people look at the work, it scares me a little bit because I don't know what, how they respond. So you get used to it, putting all your heart and soul into something and then waving goodbye. Most of these pieces have a personality of their own, which, of course, have helped play a part in developing. So when I have an exhibition, it's kind of a bittersweet moment to watch them disappear, and yet they're becoming part of another family and another household and other people's lives. It's appropriate somehow. I like it. I don't have that reverence for one particular medium that a lot of sculptors have. I like them all, and I think I can put myself into them all and feel the difference between being a wooden piece and being a bronze piece, and between the feeling of polished bronze surface which reflects everything around and the, the natural patina which brings up just the surface of the form. For example, as a composer, I want the freedom to work with a number of different kinds of instruments and sounds and textures and colors. So I work with bronze and all its types, polished, uh, patina, different colored patinas. And in the mahogany pieces, I can work also with multicolored mahogany using India ink as a polychromatic surface texture. So I think it's more of a question of finding just the right thing to convey the ideas and to, to pull out the feelings. When I make a large seven or eight foot outdoor bronze, for example, it's a question of enlarging all the volumes and the surfaces. Here I can go from small scale, tripled to medium scale, and I can triple this again. It's easy to do if you have enough styrofoam. Triple this scale would become 27 times the volume, so I have to order 27 times as much styrofoam in it. It's very exciting because it comes in on a truck and we glue it all together in the tent outside and it becomes a, an imposing Mount Rushmore block that has to be carved. So with bigger tools, bigger saws, bigger files, a larger amount of time, it's an ambitious project which gradually takes shape and renders a final, original, full-scale, seven or eight-foot master prototype, which is covered with auto body filler to render a, a very accurate finishing surface. And that, in turn, goes to the foundry, where it's molded and becomes a bronze. I love going to the foundry. There are foundries which make nothing but sculpture. And it's a, a heady experience to be there, surrounded by everyone else's work, including your own, which you're seeing sometimes for the first time. And relying on the people who know more about it than I do, who are the experts in their specialties. And that allows, I think, the sculptor to be a generalist and come up with ideas that make other people say, uh, why didn't we think of that? And at the same time, have the peace of mind of knowing that the work, no matter how complex or how sophisticated, can be successfully uh, created at the foundry. It's a special place where all the things I can't achieve myself are possible. And, of course, I rely on the expertise and judgment abilities of a lot of specialists who can do things that I'm just not capable of doing, especially at a very sophisticated level on a high-tech basis. It's a magical place and you walk around tasting the Kubrick feeling of the bronze and smelling the crackle of the welding and, and you can feel the heat from the crucibles on the side of your face and you get involved in this whole earth-wind-fire process. It's a remarkable place and uh, I think a real heaven for artists. If you asked a lot of artists why they're doing what they're doing, they'd give you the usual glorious responses. 
because it is exciting and exhilarating to do this. But if you ask them in the middle of the night, one at a time, I think a lot of them would say that it's because of mortality. And if you realize time is passing and life is short, and you want to do the most special thing there is to do, one of those things is to be an artist. It's a way of really understanding life and breathing it into the fullest. And it's an opportunity to give something back in appreciation. Most artists, I think, are philosophers by nature anyway. And they seek not the ordinary or normal or mundane parts of life, but that which is extraordinary. Here we are with our finished seven-foot bronze. Outdoors like this, it captures the light and the space and the air around it with the birds and the trees, and there really is a presence. I feel like it's another person, an old friend maybe, somebody I know and recognize, giving something back and emoting, allowing me to participate and involve myself in all these forms and swirls, where the edges that started out as drawings have now become full arm motion and the character of the sculpture really takes on a presence of its own. What I would like viewers to get from this work is a closer sense of who they are and a feeling of passion and specialness. That's, I think, what aesthetics is all about. Funding for this program was provided by the KBK Foundation, Roland Grimm, and the South Carolina Arts Commission, which receives support from the National Endowment for the Arts.